you've been with us, uh, we're studying the Beatitudes. Uh, beginning in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus preaches the longest recorded sermon in Scripture, uh, referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. This sermon begins with proclamations of blessedness. Jesus says in eight specific statements about the blessedness that is found through specific things that ultimately are quite contrary to what the world teaches us. As we've talked about the first two Beatitudes, it is not that a person is blessed. Uh, That word blessed is just meaning happy, uh, a joy that is beyond simple uh, personal satisfaction of circumstances, but a deep-seated spiritual joy. And instead of saying, happy are the people who are spiritually self-sufficient, Jesus said, happy are the people who are poor in spirit, that realize that they can't do it on their own. Jesus goes on and says, not that they are happy when they are self-righteous, but Jesus says, happy are those who mourn over their own sin." And then this, the third beatitude that we're looking at today, happy are the meek. When Jesus said this to his original audience, again, this was another time where people just were scratching their heads and say, what do you mean? The real happiness is found in meekness. Ultimately, what does it mean to be meek? Uh, If you were to look it up in the dictionary, you'd find three definitions. Uh, Meekness is enduring injury with patience without resentment. It's a fair definition. But then it goes on to say, meekness is a person who is deficient in courage or deficient in strength. Is that biblical meekness? No, certainly not. But yet still, to the people hearing this, you can imagine the shock. Because ultimately, we think if we are taking care of our own business, if we are self-assertive, if we are a person that is aggressive about the things that we think we want and need, that's where we find happiness. Meekness, on the contrary, is a person who is not self-assertive. As it was said, a person who may be injured but does not just radically break out and defend themselves against such injury. Jesus is saying, not that you have to be weak, but really meekness is the idea of power under control. It is not a lack of confidence. It is not a lack of courage. A person who knows what they should do, but they are afraid, that is not meekness. The difference is a person who is meek is a person who is not choosing to do it in their own strength, not choosing to do it uh, in their own way. A person who is meek is a person who recognizes not because of a lack of confidence, but because of their confidence and someone greater. Uh, This, Jesus is actually uh, referencing Psalm chapter 37, and I'll read this to you. Psalm 37 says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers over evil, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger, forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace." You see what's being said. This was about the nation of Israel before they went to the promised land. 
And the people who would inherit the promised land were not the ones who were just going to be aggressive and violent in their own strength. But it was also not people who were afraid. But instead of confidence in our own desires, confidence in our own abilities, it's confidence in God, waiting for God, trusting in God. In fact, it takes more courage to patiently wait on God for him to act than it does for us to just act on our own emotion. That is what meekness is talking about. Meekness is certainly not weakness. Uh, You would think of it uh, like a well-trained dog. I I volunteer as a police chaplain so I can see some of these uh, police dogs that are extremely well-trained. Most people would not look at a well-trained police dog and say, that dog is really, really weak. You could try, and, and you could try to run from them, for instance, or you could try to, uh, I'll tell you what you could do. If you see a police officer with a canine dog and you think that this dog is weak because it is under control, because it is not acting on its own will, uh, try to take the dog and see what happens. <laughs> Just saying. See, the animal has a lot of power, but the power is under control. Uh, And a dog that's well-trained is not out of fear, but a dog that is well-trained is out of its desire to please the master. And so that is power under control. Meekness is not weakness. It is a willingness for us to withhold our own judgment, withhold our own desires, and choosing to trust in God. That's what meekness is. And that's what the Bible tells us brings great happiness. If you have a copy of God's word, we're really gonna be in Matthew chapter five and all the verses very simple. Uh, We'll still read it together. But the main thing I want to talk with you about today is really answering the question, how do I know if I am meek? How do I know if I have meekness? That's what we really want to look at. But if you found the place, and as you are able, would you stand with me as a simple demonstration of respect for the reading of God's holy written and errant word. Again, we are in Matthew chapter 5, first gospel, fifth chapter, and I'll start again with chapter, or verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on a mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Would you pray with me? Uh, Lord, the, the world tells us some things that we need in order to really be happy. And they're contrary to what Jesus told us. Father, as we come to this idea of meekness, it is not an often celebrated trait in our world. But Father, we know that you celebrate meekness, that there is true joy to have an attitude like Christ, an attitude of meekness. So Lord, I pray that you'd help us understand what that means so that we could better demonstrate that meekness in our life and ultimately find the joy therein. This we ask in Christ's name. And God's people said, thank you. You may be seated. So meekness is not lack of courage. Meekness is not lack of strength. Ultimately, meekness is demonstrating self-control. It is power over ourselves. Uh, With this, this is the main idea I want you to get. God expects me, God expects me to establish self-control. To be a person of meekness is to be a person that ultimately is in control of themselves. Person that has self-control. Now, if, if you remember when I read back in Psalm 37, one of the things I think really points this out, it says uh, specifically, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. So what would be a good way to know if I am a person that has meekness? 
Well, ultimately what this passage in Psalm 37 is teaching us, a person who is meek has understood the dangers of anger. I wrote this down for point number one. I must be conscious of the dangers in my anger. That's why he's saying, guys, don't fret yourself because of what other people are doing, what other things are going on. Don't be angry. Do not hold on to wrath. So a person who is meek is a person who is in control of themselves. And one of the best ways we know if we can control ourselves is how we deal with anger. Now, does that mean that anger is always bad? Why? Ultimately, the Bible speaks a lot of anger, but it is not always mentioned as something that is always bad. In fact, the Bible speaks of God being angry, uh, specifically angry over sin. Uh, we see that Jesus, while he was on this earth, demonstrated anger. Uh, you can write down your notes if you like. Mark chapter 3, you could look at that later. Uh, but Jesus was in the synagogue and a man came up to him with a hand that needed healing. And the crowds looked at Jesus to see if he would heal on the Sabbath day. And Jesus said, is it not lawful to do good on the Sabbath? I'm paraphrasing. And they didn't answer. And it said Jesus looked at them with anger. Was that wrong? No. So what we need to be able to understand is anger is not always a bad thing, but it is potentially dangerous. So the first thing I run under point number one is anger, it can be helpful. Anger is not always bad. Really the difference I think is whether we control our anger or our anger controls us. This is what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter four and I wrote this reference in your notes. Uh, specifically, it says, be angry and do not sin. It's not saying that the presence of anger is wrong. It's saying when you're angry, you have to make sure that you don't do something wrong. So anger itself is not bad. In fact, anger can be helpful. For instance, uh, if you're a parent or a grandparent, imagine some stranger walked up and, and tried to take your child and walk off. What emotion do you think you would experience? A complete stranger walks up, grabs your kids, starts trying to walk off. You probably get angry, right? What does that anger do physiologically? It empowers you. It, it, it provides for you fuel, if you will. Uh, that when you become angry, there is an increase of blood pressure, an increase of adrenaline. Anger can fuel something that is good. And if you were going to defend your own child or defend someone in need, that anger can be helpful. We have to understand that. A, a little bit like fire, if you will. Fire itself is neutral. It's neither bad nor good, right? Right? And if it was a cold winter and you, you had a source of fire, fire would be good as long as it was controlled, right? But what happens when fire is no longer controlled? It's destructive and it hurts. So I'm not saying that anger is always bad. We have to be clear on that. In fact, the Bible speaks of God being angry, Jesus is being angry. But the problem is it can be helpful, but many times, it is hurtful. That's why I wrote down for letter B. Understanding the danger of anger is realizing when it is not controlled, it can be very, very hurtful. Now, do you know of a, a time, let's just say last couple months, that you have hurt someone because of your anger? Where because of being angry, you said something or did something that you shouldn't have done. Um, now don't raise your hand. How many people have recently experienced the hurt that can come with anger? 
whether or not it was you being angry at someone or someone being angry at you. Because we, we face that quite a lot. Anger, although it can be helpful, although it can be a good thing, when it is not controlled, it can really cause problems. I wrote this reference down in your notes, specifically Proverbs 29, 22. A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. The idea, in order to be a person of meekness, we have to understand the danger that comes with anger because we all deal with anger. There's really two types or two ways in which anger becomes hurtful. And uh, this would be anger that comes too suddenly, first of all. Uh, when a person is quick to anger, it almost is always going to be destructive. Who is more likely to be quick to anger, men or women? <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, ultimately, I don't think we can say necessarily, but... Generally speaking, there are individuals who have a short temper and uh, they often sin in anger because it comes too suddenly and they don't control it. But there's also another type of anger uh, that is also sinful. It's not anger that is happening too quickly, but it is anger that stays too lengthy. This would be not a person that blows up, but a person that clams up. A person that stays angry. Who is more likely to stay angry, men or women? All right, again, I, you know, I don't know. I'm asking you. I wasn't going to say. But usually, a person is prone to one of those sinful conduct, or one of those sinful types of anger. Uh, they are either a person to get angry too quickly, or a person that's anger stays too lengthy. It's a little bit like guests in your home. <laughs> if guests show up quickly, unexpectedly, out of nowhere, there can be a problem, right? Now, if you have a guest and then they stay way too long, it can be a problem as well. Now, that's the point with anger. Anger, although it's not bad in and of itself, anger becomes a problem, becomes dangerous, and usually one of two ways. And that's what we have to understand, and that's ultimately how we develop better self-control. And this leads me to point number two in your notes. I wrote this down in point number two. I should be capable of dealing with, with my anger. To be a person of self-control, a person of meekness, you need to be capable of dealing with anger. Now, as I said, anger often causes problems and is often hurtful in two main ways. Uh, the first we would call sudden anger. And I wrote this down for letter A in your notes. I need to resist the sudden anger. Resist the sudden anger. In fact, the Bible says it this way in James chapter 1. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, what is the problem with sudden anger? You, you might see this most in, in like situations with your family. Anger itself, again, is, is not necessarily a bad thing. So if someone does something that does not meet your expectations, a very natural byproduct would be anger, right? Am I the only one? Now, the problem comes if that anger comes suddenly. Uh, what is the temptation? To allow that emotion to take control and stop the thinking. 
And so what oftentimes can happen is someone does not meet an expectation and, and maybe they actually did something wrong and so you have this feeling of anger but then it, you know, anger feels good because it's like it's empowering and you're, you're feeling angry but then you allow it to continue and continue. You're no longer thinking about whether or not if what they did is right or wrong or if your particular response is in the same measure, you're not even thinking at all. You're seeing red and all you can do is hurt people. That's the problem. Sudden anger shuts off our thinking and just becomes a force of emotion. That's why we have to resist sudden anger. Now, there are some practical steps to resisting sudden anger. Some of you know these. Like breathing. And when you feel yourself getting angry suddenly, to, to focus on your breathing. Some of you, you maybe count to 10. Some of you uh, leave the room, go for a walk. You know, there, there are some practical things. But really, we have to understand this is also a spiritual issue. Anger is not a problem, as I said. Uh, but the Bible speaks of the works of the flesh. One of the works of the flesh is outbursts of anger. That is, because it feels good to be angry, because we're feeling this power that comes with this emotion, it, we allow our flesh to say, yeah, keep feeling that. And, and we just allow that to build. And that outburst of anger is a work of our flesh, and that is a spiritual issue. What did we talk about last week when we were talking about morning sin? It is not just that we're going to have the willpower to remove sin from our life. That's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us if we don't want to have the works of the flesh in our life, what do we do? Walk by the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the desires of your flesh. It's like the empty glass that's full of air. Uh, to get the air out, if we want, we fill the glass with something else. If we fill our life with the Holy Spirit... If each and every day we are seeking to walk by the Spirit, that helps us control the desires of our flesh. So beyond just some practical steps of, of learning how to deal with sudden anger, we have to realize it's a spiritual issue as well. Something to be praying about. Something to give to God. Uh, when you fail, when you blow up, to, to repent, to confess it. That is a spiritual issue that we have to deal with. Now, th there may be some of you that you, you have such an issue with anger that you may need some professional help, and that's okay. Uh, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, look, my anger is so out of control, I need to talk to somebody about it, someone who is trained to help me mitigate this. But wherever you are, if you are prone to sudden anger, you have to learn how to control that. Because being quick to anger that is the anger of man, and it does not produce the righteousness which is from God. There's a second type of anger. Which do you think is worse, sudden anger or sustained anger? Yeah, it's, again, it's subjective. There's no real right answer. If you are a person that holds on to sustained anger, you probably think sudden anger is worse. And if you're a person that just flies off the handle a lot, you're probably thinking sustained anger. Yeah, that's worse. But, you know, hey, they're both bad. So if I have to learn how to resist sudden anger, some of you, the answer to your self-control is learning how to release the sustained anger. And you can write that down. I wrote that in B, letter B in your notes under point number two. Person of meekness knows how to release sustained anger. Now, what do we call that process where we take anger, may have been justified, but we learn how to let it go? We call that forgiveness. I wrote this reference down in your notes, specifically um, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. You know what's nice about that statement? It's not a suggestion. As Christ has forgiven you, 
so you must also forgive. Uh, what is the time limit for anger? Does anybody know? Ultimately, uh, you remember in Ephesians chapter 4, I, I read this to you before. Uh, be angry, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So how long do you have to stay angry? You got one day. That's all you get. One day. Now, I've heard people say, and sometimes in marriage counseling, people say, I never go to bed angry. You know, if we have a fight, you know, I don't want to let the sun go down. I'm like, well, what do you do if the sun's already down? <laughs> Here's the point. It's not saying that if you, if you get angry, you've got to, Hash it out before you go to sleep because, you know, that's not always the case. Basically, what it's saying is you got one day to stay mad. Now, you may want to take 23 hours, 49 minutes. You, uh, you may want to take the whole 24 sometimes. But even righteous indignation, the anger that was justified because someone hurt you biblically, you get one day. After that, it becomes sinful. And you've got to be willing to forgive. Forgiving people does not mean that you pretend it didn't happen in the sense of like that you all of a sudden become best friends again. Forgiveness is releasing the resentment. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've got to be friends with the person. That process is called reconciliation. And many times, it doesn't happen in one day. Reconciliation is two people uh, going through a process to rebuild a relationship. Forgiveness is just saying, I can't stay mad. And you're releasing the resentment. It, it doesn't mean that the person uh, didn't do something wrong. In fact, it doesn't even mean that the person won't be punished for what they did. It just means you can't hold on to that anger. Because if it keeps in your life, that becomes sinful. Does it feel good to stay angry? I mean, do we like the fact that we hold that over someone? You know, we got this grudge, and man, it feels good to lick our wounds, and we might think it does, but we're just feeding our flesh. And what we realize when we walk out of the prison of resentment, when we unchain the grudge, we're not really letting the other person free. It's not like they're getting off because they may not even know you're mad. But when you release that resentment, you are ultimately freeing yourself. And that's what we're talking about. A person who is meek is not saying, you do whatever you want to me and I don't care what happens because ultimately we're trusting that God's gonna deal with it. You know, Roman 12, that's what it says. Do not seek vengeance. Why? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. We do not repay evil with evil, but we overcome evil with good. And so we're saying, God, I know that what this person did to me was horrible, but I've done horrible things, and I'm going to release my resentment towards them. And I'm going to get out of the way, because if you want to smack them, go ahead. I mean, it says, do not avenge yourself, but leave room for God's wrath. That's what meekness is. It's not saying that this person doesn't need to be dealt with. That's just saying, you know, it's not your place. Because you trust someone that's more powerful. You trust someone that is able. And you're saying, you know what? I don't have the freedom to hold on to this anger. I've got to let it go. Now, I don't know what you deal with. Usually a person is more prone to one or the other, sudden anger or sustained anger. And probably everyone in this room struggles with one or the other. But whichever it is, there is great joy that is found in meekness when you can learn to control yourself, including your anger. Now, let's go back to what Jesus said specifically. What did he mean that the meek will inherit the earth? Ultimately, what Jesus is saying, that in order to get into a right relationship with God, to ultimately 
be saved is a recognition that, hey, we can't do it on ourselves. We've talked about that. Uh, spiritual poverty. It's saying, I'm not self-righteous, but I mourn my own sin. And it's also a recognition that it's God who I am trusting. I'm not trusting in myself. I'm not relying on my own actions. I'm trusting his actions. So what he's really saying is, unless we first get to a point of meekness, we're not really saved. You know, what did Jesus say? If anyone would come after me, they first must deny themselves. Say, hey, it's not about me. It's not something I can do. It's about him. Now, ultimately, that attitude is something that should continue in our relationship with God. It shouldn't just be a point we come to God and say, God, I know I can't do it on my own. It's not about my desire. It's about your desire. But that should continue on. Here's the problem. We all have this thing called our flesh. And we all like to get angry, whether we want to admit it or not. And whether it's sudden anger or sustained anger, that is in opposition to what God has already brought into our life. And here's the good news, and I want to close with this. Regardless of how much you struggle with anger, regardless of how many people you may have hurt because of your anger, God can help give you victory. And I close with this, and I wrote this down as your concluding point. God can give me victory over anger. Wherever you are, whatever you've done, regardless of how much anger has caused problems in your life, God can give you victory. But it starts with this attitude of meekness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that although we can't do it on our own, although it's not something that we can just conquer with willpower, that when we surrender to you, the attitude of meekness allows us to have the control that we need to keep from hurting ourselves and those around us. So Father, right now I'm praying that we would find the joy that comes in controlling oneself. Lord, I pray for each person here in the sound of my voice, those who are listening at home, for those who have trouble with anger, whether it's sudden anger or sustained anger, Father, that we could come before the cross boldly and say, Lord, I can't do it on my own, but I need your help. That through this, Father, lives would be changed as we learn how to better control the anger that can be so dangerous. In this, Lord, we now ask that you give us victory because we ask it in Jesus' name. God's people said...